Now, Nikolai Veed is the founder of Braggy. Braggy is the company that created Dash. That's the world's first wireless earphones. And you can even wear these earphones, I understand, while you're swimming. And the crowdfunding campaign for Dash was one of the most successful crowdfunding campaigns in Europe to date. So if you have some questions about crowdfunding later, this is the guy to ask. And to my right, we have Philip Schwartz. Philip is a serial entrepreneur. His company helped to create Antelope. Now, what is Antelope? It's a muscle activating sportswear, and it helps you get more out of your exercise through electromuscular stimulation. So when you do a push up, it's giving you more resistance, and you're getting fitter faster. So welcome to both of you. It's great to have you here. I want to begin by asking a broad question. As we look to the future, five, 10, 15 years, how will wearables have transformed our daily routines? What will and won't be the same for us in the future? We'll let Nikolai start. So wearables is in the same situation as computers were in the 60s, or mobile phones were in the 80s. It's in the reading the infancy, and, and we might have a look at a peek at where it goes. But what wearables does is that brings computing to your body. That means that the wearables understand where you are, what you're doing, and also what your reaction upon that is. Not only that, but it's also a feedback system, whether it's visual or it's audible. So you'll see industries die upon the rise of wearables. Some of them are the ones that we think that will exist forever. So what happens if you don't have a display in your hand, but in your eye? What happens if you don't have hearing from everything else, but in the ear, and they're connected. And they know what you're doing. So some of the industries that might be challenged by that is the mobile phone industry. Uh, TVs, gone. So you will see a huge slide in the next 20 years of how we actually interact with computers. You just took a lot away from us in a single sentence. Our TVs, our smartphones, that's, <laughs> that's going to be a bold new future. What about you? What do you think, Philip? I think on a uh, just on a visual perspective, when you look at watches, the most prominent wearable right now, everybody is wearing them, but you only have one, two, three watches, not so many, because they're so expensive. I think the same will happen with wearables. We will all look a little bit more the same every single day, because we have, hopefully, a fantastic antelope shirt, which will stimulate your body, but you won't have 20 of these. So you, but you would want to wear something like this or similar on a daily basis. You might have three, four. So you, I think most of us will look different, uh, a little bit like Star Trek. We will have uh, not historical clothes as we have right now, jackets and stuff, but uh, suits that really adjourn to the needs of our body. All right, so no, no more sports jackets is what you're saying. Now, how about the role of aesthetics when we talk about wearables? Unlike something like a smartphone, which you just carry in your pocket, a wearable is on your body all day, every day. How important is the role of aesthetics when you guys were designing your products? How much thought did you give to what is it actually going to look like? Well, it's not just aesthetics. It's how it works. It's the experience of whatever you make. In essence, none of us really want to have a bulky thing on our arm. None of us really want to have a big thing on our head. Nothing wants to be intruded with what we do. So right now, we have to build devices that are quite big. They're not as small as we want them to be. But the future is actually that it's not aesthetics, it's experience. And all those devices disappear. You won't see them anymore. They will be embedded in whatever you do. Mm. It will be embedded in your shampoo, it will be embedded in your shoe, it will be embedded in your jacket, it will be everywhere. So it won't be something you have to put on in the morning. It will just be part of your daily experience. It will be part of your daily experience. You don't even actually know if you have it or not. OK, what do you think? I think as far as sports clothing, or if we don't speak about devices or hearables, or viable, something like this, but clothes you put on has to look good. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you won't wear it. Then it looks like something medical, not natural. Yeah. And then again, if you have the more choices you have on what you buy, of course, aesthetics play a bigger role. The functionality has to be there, yeah. but then you want to look good and feel comfortable. And I think looking sexy, shapey yeah. has a lot to do with that. Yeah. I mean. I think, just to be frank, that's one of the problems Google Glass had. There's a reason we call those people glass holes. They just don't look cool. They're kind of nerdy. I'm wondering how wearables will change in terms of 
Right now, they're a cool personal toy. I have a Jawbone, I have a Fitbit, but they're not really a real tool. What has to happen before wearables begin to disrupt industries? Well, we are, as I said before, in the, like the 60s of computing or the 80s of, of telephony. And what we're seeing right now is that these devices are more toys than real tools. And the transition from being a toy to a tool is that you are not providing just quantitative data, but qualitative data, mm -hmm. quality feedback. What am I doing? How can I do better? How can I do something different? Is it actually that I want to do, that it understands my intention, ambition, and motivation? Can you give us an example of how that might play out in day to day? Well, something very basic. If I start running and I start running too fast, the device right now knows that I'm running, I'm making steps, but in the near future, it will actually run, know what your respiration rate is, it will know what your oxygen saturation level is, it will know what your heart rate is, what your movement patterns is. And from that, it can derive that you may be running too fast in the initial part of your run. Mm. It could also be in, in different areas where it will assist rather than give you some information. And, like, and that's, that's going to be a, a big transition. For mm -hmm. that to happen, the devices need to have many sensors more than before. Mm -hmm. So these devices know what you're doing based upon the sensorics. The more sensors you have, the more you know. I think so too, to get out of the gadget area into something that really makes, improves your life or your performance. I think, for example, breast, uh, Heart rate monitors are a great example. I think there's nobody doing endurance sports training without monitoring their heart rate mm -hmm. because they can learn how to adopt their training. And I think that's where variables overall will go, that either you always want to hear, want to listen to music, so that's a benefit, or you, with our astute, you really see that you can improve your performance so you would really use it every single day. And it's not just a gadget that counts the steps you have taken, which is not really an actable information. Mm. And then again, if that is built in into the system, you could, I think really the possibilities are endless. So if, uh, if you have sensors that measure your sweat and can detect, uh, I don't know, if you have eaten something poisonous and you have to react fast. Mm. So our body knows before we actually know. I think variables are a way because they're so close to the body without interfering or you don't need needles or blood samples. I think you can measure so much, and the more people use it, the better the systems will get, and you get really a huge benefit out of it, so you would be out of your mind to not use it. Mm. Now, you mentioned, sorry, do you want to yeah. say something? Go ahead. Yeah, as an example, so I, I think that's a really good point. If my headphones work with his shirts, mm -hmm. we would start figuring out things that we didn't know before. Yeah. So now, right now, phones can speak to each other, and computers can speak to each other, but wearables can't really. And that's the challenge. And in the next few years, that's something that we have to work upon, that his shirt, my headphones, and something in the shoe can actually discuss, interpret, and feedback. OK, which one of you is going to lead that charge? I think it's going to be a few companies that are going to go together first, and then there's going to be a next step of, of standardization. And we were talking a minute ago about fitness wearables, and you make this cool technology that helps you get more out of your workout. And that's something that's really interesting, especially for professional athletes. How do you see wearables transforming the world of professional sports, where maybe before we had doping, and now we have wearables? You know, I think uh, before we had exercise, <laughs> and now we have enhanced exercise. Because uh, I think really what wearables should do is they should amplify whatever you do. So like a good pedal leg, you still have to be in the motion, but it will propel you faster. Mm. And I think the same goes for variables that just make it more convenient or uh, the performance effectiveness is uh, increased, whatever you do. And I think professional sports, they are monitored right now, mm -hmm. almost 24 hours. That will increase as well. So you, I think the talent scouting will get a lot different. When you look at professional sportsmen now, you see what properties they have and what you should look for at a young age. And so you would know what kind of sport you might excel in or what properties you have to improve on to be good in that particular sport. It's almost like your own personal coach. But absolutely. It's a personal coach, but on a, uh, if I'm a soccer, a soccer team, this will benefit me in my scouting, for example. Mm. Or if I look for rowing, I will... Uh, scout the right people with the right properties and can improve them. I think that will be the biggest difference 
in professional sports, but I think it will benefit all of us because the, as with antelope, it's a 60-year-old technique which we just made feasible for everybody for the first time. Mm -hmm. So everybody can now train as 15 years ago, only professional sportsmen could. Mm. All right, so the future is upon us. Now, you have an in-ear, a hearable, I believe it's called. What advantage does a hearable have over more traditional wearables like a watch or a wristband? Well, we want to know all these things while we do something. And while we do something, I want it to be discreet. I don't want it to take my attention away from what I'm doing. So you mentioned the glass hole factor before, which means that you take your attention away from what you're doing or from what you're looking at. So the interesting thing about the, our sensors is that, that vision is a serial immersive interface. While I look at you, I have no idea what happens over there. If I look at that, I have no idea what happens right in front of me. Hearing is different. Hearing works 24 hours a day while you're sleeping, while you're awake, and you'll be able to interact with me. You'll be able to hear that somebody closed the door, someone dropped something over there, someone might cough over there. You hear everything while you're listening to me. Mm. It's called a discrete parallel interface. Okay. So if you want to make an assistant that helps you while you do something, the eye is a very bad choice, the ear is a much better one. Now we, we've talked a lot about how the future of wearables is something discreet, something you have on your body for 24 hours a day. I'm curious in sort of a more macro sense, how you see that changing the relationship between human being and machine. Are we going to become, as Fabian Hemmert mentioned, some kind of Darth Vader cyborgs where we're reliant on our wearables to the point that we forget our humanity? I, I think we need to take a reverse look upon it. I'm 41, I'm overweight, I'm not in very good shape. Uh, I like to go running once in a while, but I'm really kind of not that motivated. I think Philip has a device he'd like to sell you yeah. <laughs> to that end. But I'm not taking the elitist approach. I think those wearables will help us with things where we get lazy. I really hope that all these devices that we make at some point may never be used. So in, the, in the far future that we have come back to a point where we understand our body, where we understand what we're supposed to do, that we feel balanced in our bodies, and that these things don't really mean anything to us anymore. Hmm. But we have come to a point where I do think that something like this would help me out. And I know it helps me out. It motivates me. Motivation is key. Yeah. Actually, we started our company on an idea based on, I learned about a swimming race, which is uh, 26 kilometers from Rappersville to Zurich, a really long race. I'm not a good swimmer. But with electromuscle stimulation, in three months, I got in the physical condition to compete in that race. And so I did 12 hours of continuous uh, swimming, crawl, which I could not imagine before. Mm. And after that, my partner and I thought, we are really on, onto something. There's so much potential in every single one of us. And we are just not using it. We are forced in chairs like this. Our body is not made for sitting mm. 12 hours a day, or if you're in a startup, even longer, or commuting by car. I think we are, as humans, we are made for action, for running around, for uh, sports, pretty much. And to give that back, that was the idea of, of Antelope, to put everybody, guys like us, who used to be sporty, are not so much anymore, but yearn to be that again. And now we have something where we can get into that uh, position without all the steps in between. So it's really bringing both worlds together, the technical sides, visions that we have with what our bodies need. And I think that's, so it's not so much Darth Vader, it's rather the Yeti Ritter who can really control his uh, potential to the, to the full. Okay, Star Wars is a big theme today, <laughs> I, I feel it. Um, how far away are we from wearables that have a degree of sentience? I remember being a kid and having Tamagotchis and Gigapets and a Furby, I'm ashamed to admit. And they could learn new things. They could really kind of sense what was going on around them, at least it seemed to me at the time. Why can't wearables do that yet? I think they have a different purpose um, than being a, a, a pet or being something that you can play around with. The intelligence behind these products even though it's advanced in its uh, development, it's nowhere close to where it could be. One of the main reasons is that all these devices are tiny, they have very small batteries, mm -hmm. they don't have a lot of processing power, and making this intelligence is in a tiny device with a tiny processor with very little power is very challenging. Mm -hmm. 
So you'll see a next step in intelligence when these devices start getting connected. They actually have the ability to connect to a bigger brain than the brain that they have themselves. And I think Nikolai and I are in the same position. We build our products on techniques or materials that did not exist when we conceived our product. So we, I hope that's true for you as Absolutely. well. We had to really uh, design our own yarn. We had to make our own material for the electrodes. So I think the, really every single month something is coming out of some research lab that will enhance further what we are capable of on bringing to the body mm. and uh, bringing in variables. And with that, I mean also apps or computing, and they will learn. They will adopt to you maybe something, uh, clothing that will adjust in size, or if you want to relax, it loosens. If you want to do sports, it uh, toughens up. Mm -hmm. If you have an injury while running, it uh, will shrink like a cask automatically. So I think there are really endless possibilities which are out there, and somebody, I'm sure, is researching them right now. They're just not there yet. Perhaps somebody in the audience, and perhaps somebody in the audience would like to ask a question to either Nikolai or Philip about the future of wearables. We'll open up the floor for a question, if there is one. Tumbleweeds again. OK, I'll ask a question. What is the wearable technology, real or imagined, get creative, that you are most looking forward to seeing in the future? I'm most really excited about not for healthy humans, but for the disparate, disabled people, and to bring back something like, I don't know, almost like an avatar, but I think we're almost there that we could record how you walk mm -hmm. and replay this onto somebody who is disabled and cannot walk right now. And uh, so I think that is what we are, or I'm really keen on seeing to really improve lives of people who are handicapped. Mm. So the vision of Bragi is that we enable every single human to achieve their full potential physically or intellectually. And we have a lot of people in this world who can't do that because of social or, or cultural backgrounds. Why I get excited is if we can, at some point in the future, help someone to learn a, a proficiency or a skill much faster than they did it before to recoup the loss that they had in learning from anyone else. Mm. So we're privileged. We are, we're allowed to go to school. We're allowed to go to university. We're allowed to, to learn anything we wanted. But how about the ones who were not? Mm. And, and that's why I see that wearables in the maybe not so distant future can start helping people do those jobs or do those tasks better than before. It's a very altruistic vision. I see the clock is telling us we have two minutes left. I want to give you both an opportunity to give the audience your closing thoughts on the future of wearables before we move on to the next topic. Philip, I'll let you start. The future of wearables, one minute. Give us your best. Yeah, I give you your personal future in the next four hours. You have the, ability, uh, the possibility to experience out there. We have a little stall where you can experience electromuscle stimulation on your arms. I think if you have never done it, it's really something you can't describe. You should definitely try it. It will improve your later life. And you can even purchase it. And uh, we have an Indiegogo campaign going two more days. So that is for your future right now. And I think the future we envision for our company is to really integrate, as Nicolas said as well, uh, the activators that we have, that we activate your muscles with a lot of sensors, so we get a smarter textile, a smarter workout. All right, the future looks bright. So the future of wearables is going to be one where we don't see them, but they help us, enable us. They make us better at what we do. They protect us while doing it, and maybe even entertain us while they're doing it. But it's something that links us with other people rather than distance us. It's something where we are not sitting with something in front of our eyes and distancing us from everyone else, but actually connecting people. I think people are awesome. It's interesting to talk to people. People are having marvelous ideas, but we just stop talking a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think, I hope that wearables will bring us to have a more connected life. It's a very optimistic view. Philip Schwartz, Nikolai V, thank you both so much for being a part of this panel discussion. Yes.